everyone, and welcome back to another day of our 30-day biology study challenge. Today, we're going to be talking about gene expression. This is day 20. So whether you're here for the full biology study challenge or you're just popping in for this one video, welcome and be sure to stick to the end because we're going to be using some active studying strategies and doing some practice questions with the content that we're reviewing today. Okay, so when we talk about gene expression, we're talking about how we're going all the way from DNA to protein and how much protein, what kind of protein is produced from different sections of DNA. And this can look really different depending on the level that we're looking at in this full process of protein synthesis or in prokaryotic versus eukaryotic organisms. So let's take a look at prokaryotic organisms first. There's two main types of operons that we're going to talk about today. Inducible, like the LAC operon, and repressible, like the TRIP operon. Inducible operons are basically ones that you can turn on, and repressible operons are groups of genes that you can turn off. And when we say turned on and off, what we mean is transcription, or the action of RNA polymerase transcribing genes, or sections of DNA, into mRNA that will later be translated into proteins. Let's start with inducible operons, or something like the LAC operon. In its usual state, we do not have transcription happening. That's mostly because we have a repressor here that's bound to a section called the operator in this operon. Now the purpose of these genes, LAC-Z, LAC-Y, and LAC-A, is to provide instructions for the cell to build parts of proteins to digest lactose. If there's no lactose in the cell, these genes don't need to be turned on because we don't need any enzyme to digest lactose. But when lactose does show up, a version of it, allolactose, can bind to the repressor, removing it from the operator. This allows RNA polymerase to move down the operon and transcription can occur. Once transcription occurs, we have the LAC mRNA, which can then later be transcribed into a protein that can digest the lactose. Once that lactose is all gone, it no longer binds to the repressor, which means it's back on the operator and we cannot have transcription any longer. So let's apply this. Let's say there's a mutation in the gene that codes for our repressor protein. Remember, the repressor is a protein itself as well. And in that mutation, allolactose can no longer bind to the repressor. What happens to our transcription? Well, if allolactose can't bind to the repressor anymore, that means the repressor stays on the operator because the repressor will not be removed unless allolactose binds to it. When allolactose can no longer bind to the repressor and the repressor stays on the operator, RNA polymerase can no longer move down the operon and transcribe the genes to generate these proteins. So we have low or no levels of transcription. Let's take a brief look at a repressible operon. This is a type of operon that's going to keep transcribing or keep producing a product until it's turned off. So in its usual state, it is transcribing and creating these proteins which will generate tryptophan, something the cell needs. But if tryptophan is present in the cell, we don't need to build proteins to make that tryptophan itself. So tryptophan will bind to repressor, bind to the operator, and then prevent RNA polymerase from transcribing the rest of these genes. Remember, operons are a type of gene regulation in prokaryotic organisms, and these groups or genes are transcribed as a single mRNA molecule, and we can have both inducible operons, ones we can turn on by removing repressors, and repressible operons, ones that we can turn off by adding repressors. Now in eukaryotic organisms, we do not have operons. Instead, we have many levels of regulation for gene expression. There's pre-transcriptional regulation, which involves several things before transcription even occurs, especially how accessible that DNA is itself. Remember all of that DNA organization we talked about, about how it's wound around proteins in its chromosomes? Well, if it's folded up in certain ways, it's hard for our enzymes and other transcription factors to access it, to actually transcribe it. So we have special complexes of molecules that can regulate the availability of parts of this chromatin in order for transcription to actually happen. Also, we're gonna have have different transcription factors that can help transcription get started in different ways. All of this is going to happen before transcription even begins. At the transcriptional level, we can have things like promoters or enhancers that are going to help regulate the initiation or the beginning of our synthesis of RNA. And then after transcription, so post-transcriptional regulation can involve lots of different things. One of the most important that we'll talk about in a little bit more detail is alternative splicing or removal of introns. So these are different sections of DNA that are non 
encoding that are going to be taken out of the mRNA before it goes on to translation. We can also have alternative splicing, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Additionally, that mRNA can have parts modified or added, like the addition 5' prime cap and something called a poly-A tail that's going to help with the stability of the mRNA molecule as it leaves the nucleus. And then once it's out of the nucleus in the cytoplasm, we have things called micro-mRNAs, and they can bind to the mRNA molecule that can, and can either prevent it from undergoing translation or even degrade it. And if that mRNA is degraded, we won't have the expression of the protein that it's coded for. Then that mRNA can be sent to different parts of the cell where there's different ribosomes that are going to translate the mRNA at different levels. So that's called mRNA localization, and all of these things are going to play a role in how much protein is produced in the cell. After translation happens, so the mRNA has arrived at the ribosomes, we have our amino acids joined together through peptide bonds. There can be modifications of those proteins like phosphorylation or even degradation too. Those proteins can be broken down by proteasomes. And so all of these factors together can contribute to the regulation of gene expression in eukaryotic cells. Let's go back and talk a little bit more about that alternative splicing, which is one of our post-transcriptional modifications. So when a gene is transcribed to make mRNA, we're going to have a copy that includes what we call coding segments and non-coding segments. Coding segments contain instructions for making those proteins, and the non-coding sections are what we call introns, and they are unnecessary for the actual assembly of the protein. So we don't need those parts, and so those parts are going to be cut out or removed. So then we get a modified mRNA that is a little bit shorter and contains all of the coding sections. Now we can also have what's called alternative splicing where we only include some of those exons or we can have exons appear in alternate formats from the same initial gene or the same initial mRNA. So for example these two mRNA sections here could both come from the same initial template but have different sections be cut out and the result would be a different type of protein. The way to remember this and keep this straight is to think of the mnemonic introns go in the trash and exons are exons. Expressed. So in the trash for introns, we cut those out, exons are expressed. But remember, we can express these alternatively, even though they're going to stay in the same order. So we're never going to flip sections one and two, for example, here, but we could go one, three, four, five, or we could go one, two, four, six, depending on what's necessary for the protein. All right, let's take it back to prokaryotic gene expression and compare the two really quickly. In prokaryotic gene expression, a lot of that is going to rely on operons. We can have one promoter for multiple genes, and there are no introns. Some sections can coil, but there's no nucleus, and so we have transcription and translation sometimes taking place in the same locations within the cell. In eukaryotic gene expression, we can have these genes that are spread out along long linear chromosomes. We have one promoter for one gene. There are many introns that are removed and we can have exons that are spliced to create that mature mRNA that's going to go and then be translated into a protein. It's highly organized. We have our chromatin wrapped around histones and there are additional control mechanisms because transcription and translation are taking place in different locations. Remember, transcription is in the nucleus. Translation is in the ribosomes in the cytoplasm. All right, it's practice time. Let's do a few practice questions to really lock this knowledge into our brain. So a gene has six exons labeled A through F. The mRNA transcript of this gene can be spliced in several ways, but to produce a functional protein, each mRNA must have exactly three three exons, two of which must be B and D. How many different mRNAs can be produced from this gene? So I recommend trying this with some scratch paper and drawing it out. You can hit pause and when you're ready, go ahead and we'll go over the answer. Correct answer is four. So there are four possibilities from this particular gene. We can have ABD, we can have BCD, BDE, or BDF. Remember in the question it says it has to have exactly three exons and two of the exons have to be B and D and they're not going to go in a different order. So these are the options that we are left with. Problem two, the same genes can code for proteins in both eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. How would the expression of a eukaryotic gene be different in a prokaryotic cell? A, during post-transcriptional modification, introns would not be removed. B, prokaryotic RNA polymerase would stop the transcription of eukaryotic, eukaryotic genes. C, the expressed protein would be made of different types of amino acids. D, the gene would not be translated because prokaryotes lack ribosomes. Think about it. Correct answer is A, during post-transcriptional modification, introns would not be removed. 
Remember, prokaryotic organisms could express the same genes that eukaryotic organisms have, but our amino acid sequence would probably end up being pretty different because only eukaryotic organisms can remove the introns from the mRNA. All right, let's do an operon question. Which of the following models correctly shows how the LAC operon would behave when lactose is not being utilized? So these are simplified versions of one of our operon examples, LAC op operon, and we only have three options because that's all I could fit on the slide. <laughs> go ahead and pause and we'll go over the correct answer when you're ready. Correct answer is B. So here transcription is blocked and the gene is turned off. It's not able to be transcribed, so we won't have any translation. There's no protein because we don't need it to digest lactose. Day 20 gene expression. Tomorrow is day 21 biotechnology. Be sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on any of our videos from our 30 day study challenge. Thanks so much for watching. Give this video a like if it's been helpful and I'll see you later.